I'm going to go ahead and get started. And if people join um, in the first couple minutes, we're just going to do some housekeeping anyway, so that is fine. Um, welcome to our webinar, Student Speech from Armbands to Snapchat, with special guest Mary Beth Tinker. Um, I am from an organization called Street Law that you'll hear more about later. We're facilitating this webinar, and we're hosted today by the Eighth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Missouri, and the Judicial Learning Center in St. Louis. This is our agenda today. We're going to start out with a brief welcome overview and introductions. And then we're going to talk about the case Tinker v. Des Moines, so you can learn all about this really important First Amendment uh, student speech case. We're going to take it to the present with a case that was just argued and decided last term, Mahanoy Area School District v. BL. And we're going to look at how we take the precedent that was established in uh, Mary Beth Tinker's case, Tinker v. Des Moines, and apply it to this recent case. And we're going to save some time for Q&A with Mary Beth Tinker because um, that's really the star of the show. We're going to start out with a welcome from uh, Chief United States District Judge, the Honorable Rodney W. Sipple, and he's going to say a couple words to you. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. It coincides with the opening of the exhibit in our courthouse here in St. Louis which I hope eventually you can come visit and see the uh, Tinker Against Des Moines exhibit featuring Mary Beth Tinker and our history and the interaction, which gave rise to one of the most uh, important free speech cases for students in the history of our country. And you have the unique and wonderful opportunity today to interact with Mary Beth and on behalf of the federal judiciary your participation alone is important to the uh, judicial branch. The more you understand about your rights, the more you understand about our court system, the better off we all are and the stronger our country is in the long run. So thank you again for joining us today for this great event. Thank you, Judge Sipple. Your facilitator today will be me. My name is Kathy Ruffing. I taught um, in public high school for 27 years and now I work at Street Law. And um, my colleague, Bianca, who can introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Bianca Rizzio, Program Coordinator at Street Law and I'm delighted to be here with you all today. So students, your teachers always tell you that you should know the source of your information. So we just want to tell you briefly that we are an organization called Street Law Inc. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan group that works to promote law-related education. Um, and we were um, contacted by the Judicial Learning Center that we've done work with in the past to facilitate this discussion with Mary Beth. So now we'll get to um, the star of our show, Mary Beth Tinker. Um, Mary Beth, of course, is an advocate for student speech rights today. She was one of the Tinkers in the famous um, landmark case, Tinker v. Des Moines, that you're going to hear all about today. Um, and it's because of her that you have a lot of your free speech rights in school. Um, she also is a lifelong educator. She goes all around the country in, um, with her Tinker Tour, and Bianca is going to drop the link in the chat for teachers if you want to um, find out more about the Tinker Tour and her experience teaching or talking to classes. Um, my first experience with Mary Beth was when she would come to my classroom and speak to my students um, for many years. She's also a retired pediatric nurse, so she's really devo devoted her whole life to caring for young people. So Mary Beth, I'll let you say a couple words and introduce yourself as well before we jump into the rest of the program. Hello, and thank you everyone for coming today. We've had a really good morning over at the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals Courthouse. Thank you to Street Law and to Judge Sippel and to all of the people, Rachel March Martin from the courts who made this day happen. And we're gonna have a really good day talking about the rights of young people. And I'm so, so touched that so many teachers and students are talking about students' rights and also encouraging the students 
to use their rights and students, you are using your rights. So that's what this is all about. Thank you for coming today. So today we are celebrating two things. Today is Bill of Rights Day because it was on December 15th that the Bill of Rights were ratified in 1791. And we're also celebrating the fact that Mary Beth Tinker's armband that used to be displayed in the museum in Washington, D.C. is going to be displayed at the Judicial Learning Center in St. Louis, Missouri. So there's a picture of the display. Um, and as Judge Sippel said, hopefully some of you will have a chance to visit. I'll, sometime. So let's talk about how to participate in today's webinar. For those of you watching this live, there are two ways to participate. And teachers, I'm going to give you a couple minutes after I'm done talking about this to discuss with your classes how you would like them to take advantage of this. Um, if students have their own devices, they can text us at that number, which Bianca will also put in the chat, 240 863-2406, um, but students please obey all classroom rules. So if your teacher um, does not allow you to use uh, your own devices in the classroom and phones, please don't. Um, teachers, you could get questions from students on slips of paper or some other way um, and leave them in the Q&A. So um, for anyone who is logged in, the Q&A will be available to you. Um, or if you're watching this, projected in a classroom, um, you can text or communicate those questions to your teacher who can drop them in the Q&A. So I'm going to give teachers about two minutes to discuss with their classes how they would like them to participate in um, the webinar. Please feel free, uh, students and teachers, to drop your questions at any point. Um, we will try to incorporate questions as we go. Um, and if we can't do that, we will come back and use um, the Q&A when we get to the Q&A portion. So Bianca um, primarily will be monitoring the um, Q&A and the texts. And so she may interject here and there and ask um, some questions to Mary Beth as they, as they come up in our conversation. So now we're going to talk about the case Tinker v. Des Moines. Some of you may be really familiar with it. You may have already studied it. And some of you, it may be the first time you've heard of it. So we're going to start from the beginning of the story which is the First Amendment. So the First Amendment to the Constitution has your five freedoms. Um, and the freedom we're going to focus on today is the freedom of speech. And it reads, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Because of the 14th Amendment later in history, that, um, that extends also to the states and institutions of the state, which a public school is an institution of the state. <clears throat> There's a, a history of First Amendment cases, but the one we're gonna um, highlight just for a moment before we jump into the details of Tinker v. Des Moines is a case called West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett. And it's one of the very um, first cases that happens in a public school that deals with speech. So this case dealt with the um, flag salute and the Pledge of Allegiance. So you can see the picture there. You can see these students saluting the flag. And in the 40s, that's the way students saluted the flag. Um, it got changed um, over the history of the 40s and 50s to putting your hand over your heart, largely because um, you're probably already thinking that that looks a lot like the Nazi salute. Um, so this, there was a case before this case, the Gobitis case, in which the Supreme Court said that states, uh, that 
that public schools could require students to stand and salute the flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, if students didn't, they could be disciplined. So in that case, the Supreme Court said that that was fine. This case, which only happened a few years later, reversed that decision and said that these students, in this case, Jehovah's Witnesses, who had a religious objection to having um, to pledge allegiance to something other than God um, and salute it, um, were allowed to, um, to quietly abstain so they could sit and not pledge and not have to pledge or salute the flag. So this was really the one of the first cases that um, that protected students speech rights in schools and religious rights in schools. And so this case kind of lays the groundwork for Tinker, although Tinker really is in a class all of its own as the um, as the case that really sets out student speech rights. So Mary Beth, your case is about whether the First Amendment amendment protected you and your brother and your friend from being suspended for wearing black armbands to school. Can you tell us a little bit about why you wore the armbands to school? Yes. Well, the first time that I had experience with a black armband was when I was 11 years old, a couple years earlier in 1963, when the Birmingham Children's Crusade rallied and marched in Birmingham, Alabama to speak up for racial justice. And these kids were not able to go into the stores to try on things. Their schools were inadequate. The jobs their parents could have were, were inadequate. Housing, all of it. There's great discrimination as we know. And so the kids, as kids tend to do, spoke up for justice and spoke up against unfairness. And they rallied and sang songs like this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, the white supremacists, the Ku Klux Klan, did not like that. And so they bombed the headquarters of the kids, this, of the uh, Birmingham Children's Crusade in 1963, that September 15th. I had just come, I had, I had just been at a picnic there with my family when someone came by to tell us what had happened and how four little girls, the same ages as me and my sisters, 11 to 14 years old, had been killed. Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise. So us kids were so sad about that and so upset. And we heard about a plan by James Baldwin, the writer, he said the people all around the country should have memorial services and should wear black armbands to mourn for the little girls. And what had happened to these kids who had been so brave and spoke up for democracy and justice and those ideals of our democracy. So we, that's me in the middle at the service there in Des Moines in 1963 in September. I was 11 and over to the right, my big sister, Bonnie, and my little sister, Hope, and to the left, Linda and Phyllis. And that was my first experience with black armbands, but we did not wear them to school. And so that's when I learned, though, the meaning of black armbands, to mourn for someone who has died. Now, I was encouraged kids to do a report about the Birmingham Children's Crusade, because they, like kids all through history, spoke up and took our country towards its ideals. After that, it was another time of young people speaking up for justice and for a better world, just like now. This time it was 1964, Mississippi Freedom Summer, when students came from all over the country to Mississippi that summer to help register African-American voters. And here they are training and singing in Ohio where they went first to practice how to go up against the violence that they knew they would be facing by the Ku Klux Klan. And so they trained there in Ohio and then they went on to Mississippi. And as soon as they got there, three of them, immediately disappeared. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, 
and Michael Schwarner. Everyone suspected that the Ku Klux Klan had kidnapped the students and probably killed them. So that summer on August 4th, the bodies were found of the three young men. And as a result, several important things happened. Well, one important thing that happened was that the Civil Rights Act was passed then in 1964, saying that you cannot discriminate in a public place like a restaurant or a hotel. My parents also went to Mississippi that summer. My father was a Methodist preacher and they believed that you should put your values into action. And so my parents went to Mississippi and they said, we can't just preach about love and understanding. We have to go and stand with these brave people. And so they went to Mississippi that summer. They came home on my 12th birthday and told us kids what had happened. Now there's a big debate in our country about whether students should learn these stories, these, this history. My parents believe that students should know the truth about our country and that that will help us grow as a country. And I believe so also, and I think it's only fair to the people who sacrificed their lives. So in 1964, then in the fall, that fall, well, yeah, on the same day, that the bodies were found of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, the three young civil rights workers. August 4th, 1964, that same day off the coast of Vietnam, a U.S. Navy ship claimed it was attacked, the USS Maddox. And within days, the Congress voted almost unanimously for the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And President Johnson signed it immediately to start sending thousands more troops to Vietnam. That fall then, some students in Mississippi, some young high school students, black students in Mississippi, to protest the murders of the three young men, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. They wore buttons to school that said one man, one vote, and they were told they could not do that and a court case started working its way through the courts. And those students won their case a couple of years later in 1966 when the appeals court in Mississippi said that the students should have been allowed to wear those buttons. Why? Because they had not substantially disrupted school. So all of this was going on at the same time. But by, in 1965, the year after the Tonkin Resolution, us kids were really feeling sad about the war, the buildup of it. We were already sad about the Birmingham children and what had happened to the three civil rights workers in Mississippi. And now we're seeing war, war, war on the news all the time. There's a lot of sadness going on right now among kids and adults too in our country, but it's really important that young people are able to express themselves about how they feel about what's going on in the world. War, racism, all kinds of issues, the climate. And I am so glad that young people are expressing themselves, but we wanted to express ourselves in the whole range of emotions. And one of those was grief and sadness, but uh, that was threatening to our administration. And so when they heard about our plan to wear black armbands again, but this time for the dead in Vietnam and to call for a Christmas truce there, the administration was threatened by that and they made a rule against kids wearing black armbands to school. And so we went to the school board and we tried to change their mind, that's me and my mother beside me, my father behind me, and a couple of the kids at the high school who were involved, Chris Singer for one over there on the left. But my father, he didn't think we should wear the black armbands. And he said, you know, the principals have a job and it's not so easy. And I don't know if you should be wearing those black armbands. They make a rule against it. But you see, kids are so persuasive. So we said to our dad, but dad, Look how you stand up for what you believe in. You even went to Mississippi and risked your life to speak up 
And so we convinced him. So that's how we ended up wearing black garments to school. And I was so nervous and less than 10 kids wore the black armbands. Five were suspended. Some people got really, really mad at us for doing that. And they said, you kids don't know anything, which some adults like to say about kids, which is so not true. We knew plenty. We knew how we felt when we saw what was going on. And we wanted to express that. And even though people got mad at us for that and they threatened us and they threw red paint at our house and even threatened to bomb our house, but one group, the American Civil Liberties Union, they were good to us and they offered to help us. They go to court more than any organization in the United States. They go to the Supreme Court more often than anyone. And so they came and offered to help us. Mary Beth, before we go to court, can you tell the students a little bit about that day at school for you, how the, how the day went for you? Yeah, yeah, that day, I was so nervous, and I wasn't sure if I should do it or not, especially because the principals had made a rule against it, and I was just, I, it was a combination of strong feelings and having an example, having examples of people who do something about their feelings, like the Birmingham kids and my parents. And so I went to all morning, nothing happened. I had on my black armband and my friend Connie said, you better take that off, it's against the rules. I, I said, we can't, Connie, I, I'm so sad about the war. At lunchtime, I was at the, the girls table. There was a girls table and a boys table for lunch. We used to sit together. The boys started teasing me, but I just ignored them like I always did. Then after lunch, I went to my favorite class, math. I loved math. Class. Well, I liked social studies too, but I loved math. And so I, I started to go towards the door of math class. My teacher, Mr. Moberly, who I really liked, was standing at the door with a pink pass. And he said, here you go, go to the office. You're wearing that armband, it's against the rules. So I went down there and I was so nervous. And I went into the office and the vice principal, Mr. Willitson, he said, now Mary Beth, that's against the rules. So take off that armband. I looked around the office and I looked at Mr. Willitson and I took off the armband and I got suspended anyway. Well, I learned a very important lesson that day. Even if you're scared and nervous and tense and you wanna express yourself about something, you should because it's okay, you can still do something, even if you're nervous and scared. So I took my suspension paper and I went home that day. Two other kids got suspended that day, Chris Eckhart and Bruce Clark. The next day, my brother John got suspended and Chris, five kids got suspended. And you were 13 at the time? I was 13. I was in eighth grade. It was 1965. Now, my little sister, Hope, was in fifth grade. My little brother, Paul, in second grade. They wore black armbands to school, too. They said, we want peace. We want peace, too, which kids do want peace. As I speak with students all over the country, of course, young people want peace. And young people are speaking up about these issues and so many others. Great. Now we can now we can go back to the story about how your case um, made it through up to the Supreme Court, so, and and maybe a little bit along the way about how it feels to be a 13, 14 year old with your um, case going in front of all of these important courts and also yeah. the Supreme Court. It, it felt really crazy, Kathy, because we thought it was going to be a small thing that we did. And then it turned out to be a big thing. But I found out later that is usually how history is made by the small actions of ordinary people. And so when, when we did this, I was suspended and we tried to change, we went back to the school board, tried to change their mind again. They would not change the rule. Although some of the school board did vote for us. And they said, this is ridiculous. These kids aren't hurting anyone. They should have a right to express their feelings. Well, the American Civil Liberties Union offered to help and it went to court. We went to the district court, which is the local federal court where we lost. And then it was appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I'm so honored that that is where the armband and my report about it that I wrote for school 
in eighth grade is going to end up in their display there, which is so great. And I hope you can all see it. So I, we went to the Court of Appeals where we lost again. The lawyers argued, our ACLU lawyer, he was so great, Dan Johnston, a young man right out of law school. And he argued and he said, well, you know, the, the uh, students haven't hurt anyone. They should have their rights too. And so the judges couldn't decide in the end. It was split, a tie, which had the effect of making the district court's opinion stand. In other words, our loss at the district level held. Mary Beth, so, can, I Chris, can I ask you a quick yeah. question about one thing that you just said about how the students yes. didn't hurt anyone? So important to this case is going to be what happened at the school that day as a consequence of those 10 students wearing armbands. So can you tell us briefly, you know, was there, were there fights? Was, was there a commotion? Yes. There wasn't this, no, there was no disruption. I talked to one of the school board's uh, assistant, the lawyer, one of the lawyers who was assisting, he said his job was to search and try to find some kind of disruption. But he never could find any because there was no disruption. If there was any disruption at all, it came out in court. It was on the part of my math teacher, Mr. Moberly, who had spent the whole class before this talking about what would happen to kids if they dared to wear a black armband to school. But there wasn't disruption in the schools. At Roosevelt High School across town from me, one of the gym teachers harassed the students, called them pinkos, called them communists. And at lunch that day, one of the students got hit, but there was no real disruption at any of the schools. There were three schools that were involved. Well, there was actually four, there was five actually considering the elementary schools also, but um, they never could find any substantial disruption, which was important because right around the time we lost our case at the appeals court, over in Mississippi at the appeals court, the Mississippi kids, the black students who spoke up against racial racist violence by wearing the buttons to school for voting rights, they won their case. And the court said they should have been allowed to wear those buttons, why? Because they did not substantially disrupt school. And that is where that standard comes from. It comes from a case called Burnside. So now you have two appeals courts in the United States ruling differently. That's called a circuit split. Two appeals courts rule different, have different opinions about whether kids have rights, public speech or free speech rights in school. So our young lawyer for the ACLU appealed it to the Supreme Court which hardly takes any case, they don't hardly take any cases, they take around 70 a year out of around 10,000. We were really surprised when they took the case. We didn't have to pay any money because that's how the ACLU works. And we also didn't win any money from the ruling. When we won, when I was a junior in high school, February 24, 1969, I was so surprised when we won because we had lost at both levels before that. And I was so happy when the Supreme Court said through Abe Fortas, Justice Abe Fortas, who wrote the opinion, that neither students or teachers leave their constitutional right to expression when they enter the schoolhouse gate. And one of my favorite parts is that students are persons under the constitution. It says right there in the ruling, students are persons with the rights and responsibilities of persons. So it was a great victory and it was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful explanation of what education should be in a democracy. The ruling also said there's two things students cannot do with their free speech rights. Number one, disrupt, substantially disrupt school. And for that, they quoted the Mississippi case, Burnside. And number two, impinge on the rights of others whatever that means. And that's been debated ever since. But it was a really beautiful ruling. And it says that, yes, some things you hear or talk about are going to be controversial, but that's a price we have to pay for democracy. So we need to be able to talk about controversial things. This case is about 
talking about controversy in classrooms. And of course, we want to do that with respect for each other. And that's what I talk to students all over the country about, how we can talk about things we disagree about that are controversial, but we can still have respect for each other. Yeah, that picture is me and my little brother, Paul, who had worn an armband to second grade, and my mother. And that's the day we won the case in St. Louis. And did you, know, you do anything to celebrate or? Well, yeah, we did actually. It, it, you know, it was really hard to be real happy. I have to admit because it was one of the worst day, worst years for the Vietnam War. And there were so many, you know, people, Vietnamese and US soldiers being killed and injured. It's considered a war of atrocity. There were so many horrible things that were happening in the war. So I, I was a little bit, you know, sad even then because I said, oh great, now we can wear a little black cloth on our arm, but the war was raging. But my mom did go and buy some ice cream and some soda pop, so we had a celebration anyway. That's great. So Mary Beth mentioned um, substantial disruption, and one of the things um, you're going to find out about this case that makes it such a landmark case is that it establishes what we now call the Tinker Test, named after Mary Beth, or the substantial disruption uh, test. And it's been used in lots of different cases. These are images from four um, pretty famous cases, two that went to the Supreme Court and two that did not, that stopped at the appeals court level. Um, but they, they all deal with two really important things that come out of Tinker v. Des Moines. One is student speech and the really important quote that Mary Beth just read you about students and teachers keeping their rights at the schoolhouse gate and that sometimes um, speech is expression and not just what you say, but things that you wear or, you know, some way that you're protesting. Um, and this idea that um, where the line changes from something being expression that is protected in the school to, to expression that can be disciplined in the school is if it causes a substantial disruption. So unfortunately, we don't have to, time to go into all of the details of this, these cases, but I will tell you that um, three of these images, one, um, the one that you see of the, the student in front of um, Bethel Senior High School, who gave a speech that had some um, lewd language in it, the Bong Hits for Jesus banner, and the student wearing the Confederate flag, um, courts found in those cases that those three things all caused a substantial disruption. And so that's those forms of speech were not allowed. The last one that you see that um, this was a case that stopped at the appeals court level were some elementary school students who wore I heart boobies bracelets um, to show awareness and support for breast cancer um, research and fundraising. And that was um, the court found to be not a substantial disruption in the school, so allowed. And um, the, that case was um, appealed to the Supreme Court by the, the school that lost, but the Supreme Court decided not to take it, in which case the lower court decision stands. So this is all really important because um, these things, the Tinker case and then those other cases, um, represent precedent. So precedent is a court decision about a legal question um, that guides for future cases with similar questions. So Mary Beth's case was about um, symbolic speech, wearing the armband instead of saying, I'm against the war, they showed it with a symbol, and um, student speech. And this is important because for the most part, the um, Supreme Court decides its decisions on something called stare decisis or stare decisis or, you know, it's Latin, so there's many different pronunciations. Um, but it's the idea that if there is a precedent that's really similar to the case, that you should decide that the new case um, in the same way. And if the case, um, if the precedent is a different enough from the new case, you might have a different decision. So Tinker v. Des Moines is used as the most important precedent about student speech in any of these student Supreme Court cases. So we're going to take a look at um, a new case and, and decide, think about how we might apply Tinker to this case. And um, you're going to hear from Mary Beth her really important role in this case as well, this case that just got argued last term. 
So this case is about a cheerleader in um, a school called Mahanoy Area High School. And um, this is a picture of her. These are the general facts of the case. So um, she was a sophomore um, and she had made the, um, the cheerleading team in her freshman year, the JV team, and tried out for the varsity team and was hoping to make it. As I'm sure a lot of um, you students can understand when you go out for a team and you don't make it, it's really disappointing and you have your emotions are running high. So that weekend on a Saturday, off campus at sort of um, a convenience store. And those two things are gonna be important that it's a weekend and a convenience store, not on school. She um, used Snapchat, which I'm sure most of you know is an app where the messages disappear in 24 hours. Um, but you know, they can be screenshotted and shared. So while you know that your message is gonna disappear, you also know that there is potential for someone to uh, freeze that image with screenshot and share it anyway. So she snapped, um, chatted her and a friend and that holding up their middle fingers and um, the message you see there, F school, F softball, F cheer, F everything, but she did not put the asterisks. She wrote out the word. Um, and that might be important to how you think this case um, is applied. So I mentioned that. Um, and one of her teammates on the cheerleading team Snapchatted it and um, it eventually was shared with the mom of one of the cheerleaders who was also a cheerleading coach. And the coaches got together and they decided that this violated um, a school um, pers uh, a school rule that they had that cheerleaders and athletes would not um, use uh, obscene language, would not say anything on social media that against their team, um, would not um, represent the, the school in any negative light. So she was suspended from the cheerleading team for a year and there were no other disciplinary measures taken. She wasn't kicked out of school or suspended from school, but she had to wait um, a whole year to, um, to be able to go out for the cheerleading uh, team again. And so she appealed this case um, to her, uh, the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. Um, and they, um, and at that level, um, they asked, uh, she was asking that she be reinstated to the team, that the school um, take clear off her disciplinary record, um, and that they award her mon money damages. Um, and the district court she won in the district court and got all of those things. And so it was appealed again um, to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Um, and they agreed with the lower court decision, but for different reasons. They, they thought that um, Tinker should never be applied off campus. If the speech is happening off campus, um, it can't be applied. So I want you to think about how you would apply Tinker to those facts. Um, and Mary Beth is going to tell you a little bit about how um, she and her brother filed something called an amicus brief, where they, they made uh, their opinions on this case and how they thought their case applied to this modern case um, official and, and uh, um, gave this, their opinion to the Supreme Court in what is called an amicus curiae brief. Yes, thank you. This case, Mahanoy versus BL, who was actually Brandy Levy, uh, was also an ACLU case. In fact, all of these student free speech cases after ours at the Supreme Court have been ACLU cases. And my brother and I have weighed in on a couple of other cases with amicus briefs. An amicus brief is a way that an organization or an individual can say how they think the case should be decided. So we weighed in on a couple of other ones, one having to do with kids wearing American flag shirts on their shirts in California, and another one called, with, um, called Bell, which was a student doing a rap song in school. But in this case, we weighed in and, and uh, two lawyers wrote the brief and, and we helped with that some and we signed off on it. And our opinion was basically that if you rule against Brandy Levy, then 
it's just going too far because anything that a student says or does outside of school then could be open for censorship or for punishment by the school. And that is going too far. That was our, our main argument. And when I was listening, when listing the facts from the case, I didn't stay, say specifically about the substantial disruption, but can you weigh in on what you thought about what the substantial disruption, um, was there a substantial disruption in this case? And did you guys weigh in on that? Since that's- That was another thing that, that was another thing that helped uh, Brandy Levy to win her case because there was no substantial disruption that Brandy caused and actually, Remember now that Brandy Levy apologized also to the school when, at, immediately when this all happened in the beginning, but the school would not accept that and they took it to court anyway. So I think that's another lesson for schools and for administrators is to try to work with students when these things happen and don't escalate it by going to court. If you, you, know, if you can solve these things in other ways. Yeah, much like Mary Beth's case, they they looked, um, they interviewed people at the school and looked for disruptions. And the disruption that was cited um, as the biggest disruption was one of the cheerleading coaches also taught math. And so apparently some of the students in the class were asking her in class, trying to have conversations with her in class about what might happen to Brandy Levy and you know what the cheerleading coaches were were planning to do about it but that was the biggest disruption that they could find yeah and under tinker the speech that is is um you know can be stopped by administrators it's supposed to be a substantial disruption if students ask a few questions or there's an disagreement a student wore a shirt to school in Arizona that said Black Lives Matter for photo day. And she was told she could not do that. This was a few years ago, Mariah Havard. Why? The school said, because you and another student had an argument about that last week in school. Well, that's not a substantial disruption. So Mariah in the end was allowed to wear that t-shirt and she did prevail. And um, so remember it's, you know, what is a substantial disruption? It's a little bit in the gray area, but there is that issue also. Great. And while I was speaking, um, Bianca dropped in the chat for teachers um, a YouTube link to an interview with Brandy Levy. It's one of the CNN interviews. She's actually given several interviews. Um, and so if you would want to find more details about this case and, and her opinion on it and her lawyer's opinion, um, you could watch that interview. Um, I should probably mention for the, for the students that the reason um, the brief has BL um, it says right after it, you can see where it says a minor, um, even though the family has come out publicly and they've done interviews, we know that her name is Brandy Levy. Um, when minors are involved in cases, generally the, um, the initials are used. So this case was decided at the end of last term. So it was argued in at the end of April. It was decided on one of the very last days of the term. And the Supreme Court decided eight to one um, that the uh, that Brandy Levy should win this case. And they found that her school violated her um, free speech rights because um, her speech was off campus and provided, did not provide a substantial enough reason, um, a substantial enough disruption to be a reason to, um, to stop her speech. So that's really important because um, what they didn't say was that schools can never regulate off-campus speech, um, but they also said that, that in this case, it was not substantial enough. So it was definitely a win for student speech um, because if they had allowed um, this case, if they had reversed the decision in this case, pretty much all student speech um, off campus could have been regulated by the school. Um, but it doesn't, it also doesn't say the school can never regulate off campus speech, just that it would have to have um, a substantial enough reason for doing so. Mary Beth, do you want to add anything to that before we move on to Q&A? 
No, I guess just that the only justice voting against Randy Levy was Clarence Thomas, who it is well known that he's not a supporter of student speech rights. And he had also called for the reversal of the Tinker ruling in another case called Morris v. Frederick, the, the famous bong hits for Jesus case. So Clarence Thomas was the only justice that voted against Brandy Levy's free speech rights. And some people have said that, well, Brandy was just, you know, cursing her cheerleading. That's not important to protect. But I say that it's important for students to be able to express themselves about all the issues in their lives and that students are the ones who should be able to decide what's important to you. It's not up to me or any adult to decide what you want to express or what issue is important to you. Yes, she did curse, but that's an issue between her and someone else, but it shouldn't, there shouldn't be a law or a punishment from the school for her doing that in my opinion, and also in the Supreme Court's opinion. Okay, we were kind of rushing through some of that because we really wanted to make sure we got to the Q&A um, with Mary Beth because that is generally um, what students are waiting for. So this is our time for Q&A. I am going to leave this slide up during Q&A so that you have that number that you can text questions to. Um, and teachers, you are also welcome to, um, to drop questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to turn things over to Bianca a little bit to um, field some questions to Mary Beth. Great. Thank you both. Um, I really appreciate you all sending in your questions as Mary Beth was talking. We have quite a few of them. So let's get started. Mary Beth, why are student rights important to you? And do your brother and friend still actively speak for student rights? Yes, my brother and friends do, except for the other plaintiff in our case, Chris Eckhart, who was a wonderful, beautiful soul. He died a few years ago. But it's really important for students' rights to be protected because when youth in any society speak up for their own interests, and about the issues that affect them. This helps not only you as youth, and I found out it's actually good for your health, it's good for your physical health, emotional health, mental, social, all of it, to express yourselves and take action about these things. It's also good for the society. And a society that is good for young people, as it turns out, is good for everyone. Great, thank you. So what is a student right that students have but don't know that they have? Hmm, yes, that's very interesting. A lot of times students don't think they have the right to say something that might be controversial. And so I'm glad that students are learning about this case and this ruling because yes, you do have a right to talk and you need to talk about things that are controversial. I think that's a, a common one. Awesome. So if students want to use their free speech to really send a message about their ideas, what is the best way to do that? There are so many ways to do it and so many creative ways. And some students in Rhode Island, they got tired of all the test, test, test all the time. So they dressed up like guinea pigs and rats and they went off to testify at the Rhode Island legislature. Other students are speaking about Black Lives Matter. Other students are campaigning with their schools to change the dress code or change the uh, lunches. I've talked to students that have campaigns about the school lunches. And there are so many ways you can do it. I say number one, identify something that you think is not fair, or could be improved. Number two, check out who's already maybe working on it. Maybe you could join up with them. There, there's power in numbers. And then you can think about how you can use your First Amendment rights. The right to free speech, free press, freedom to assemble, the right to petition, and the right to your own religious beliefs and your beliefs. You can use those rights to advocate for something that you care about. And when you do, I found out it's a great way of life. Awesome, thank you. Now, one student is wondering what your favorite thing to teach students is. What's your favorite thing? 
wow, one of my favorite things to teach students is how kids dressed up like guinea pigs and rats and went off to the Rhode Island legislature and, and how you can have fun even speaking up about things that you care about. And so that's really an important thing that, and it's, and it's good to teach students that it's a good way of life. You meet people like I'm meeting people today talking about all these things. And it's a way that you can live your life and, and change things that need to be changed. Sorry, Beth, there's a question in the Q&A. Um, in, the, in the BL case, would, the, would it be different if the message was specifically directed at the coach or the school principal? It is possible that that could have influenced the decision because it came out very clearly that no one's rights were impinged on in Beale's actions. And under Tinker, there was some question in, in Mahanoy about whether or not the Tinker standard should even be used. But if it was, then it would have to be substantially disruptive or impinging on the rights of others. And it was very clear that Brandy Levy didn't target any specific person or impinge on anyone's rights by expressing her frustration and her feelings about cheerleading. There were also a lot of questions about um, whether or not she identified the school. So she didn't have her cheerleading outfit on. Um, she didn't have like a, an insignia from her school. And so we don't know whether it would have made a difference. It doesn't seem like it from the opinion that it would have made a difference because again, like Mary Beth has said several times, um, it wouldn't have probably impacted the disruption. But, um, but the, those things all did come up. That was a great question because those things all did come up in oral arguments about whether or not there were specific coaches mentioned, the school was identified, she was wearing a uniform, all those things. Yes, it was true. And there are a number of organizations that also filed amicus briefs in favor of Brandy Levy. A number of actual states filed opinions in favor of her, as well as some anti-bullying groups um, and various educators and others. So she had quite a bit of support uh, but, you know, who knows what would have happened if some of these other things, if she had been wearing her uniform, I don't see how it would matter, as you said, Kathy, because, I mean, she has a right to wear her school uniform wherever she goes. doesn't mean she's representing the school. But in, these are legal issues that get so interesting, and that's why I'm so glad that you students are learning about these things and talking about these things, because it's not like there's some adult somewhere that knows the answer to all of these things. So you might as well learn about them and weigh in also. We have some excellent questions rolling in. It's clear you're all paying attention and thinking critically. So that's great. And I think while Mary Beth is still with us, we should know this question, which is how did people react to your case? And did you lose any friendships for wearing the armband? I didn't lose any friendships and the reaction was mixed. Some people got really mad. Some adults, you know, put down kids. Yeah, that was one of the postcards that we got saying that we're communists and we hate you. And um, my mom would say, we're not communists, we're Methodists actually. Um, but it was really mixed. Some people, uh, Lieutenant Corporal from the Marines wrote a letter to the editor saying that these kids should have their right to express themselves. That is hypocritical. And so, you know, there were just different reactions. But I want to also add that if anyone wants to write to me, if we run out of time or if you have other questions or comments and you want to tell me what you're speaking up about, write to me at tinkertour at gmail and I'll write you back. Thank you, Mary Beth. We definitely won't be able to get to all of the questions. So I would encourage you all to take her up on that really generous offer. Um, we do have one more question that we probably have time for. And this student is wondering how bullying affects students' freedom of speech and when should schools step in? Yes, bullying is very important and it came up a lot in the Mahanoy case because uh, I know as a nurse that there are certain situations with kids that some of us teachers, principals, nurses, counselors, we're required to take action about bullying 
And a lot of times that may be happening outside of school. It may be something going on in the family that we're required to look into and to take action on. So I think it's very important. I believe that the best thing to, best way to deal with bullying is to prevent it. So we could have programs starting in preschool and kindergarten, teaching kids to respect each other, teaching kids communication skills. That's not something you're born knowing. Teach people how to listen to each other and respect each other and to reply with respect. And so I think we also have to be concerned with students who are showing bullying behavior. And I was talking to some eighth graders earlier today who said that they really care about that too. And I've talked to kids who have started programs at lunchtime to make sure every kid has someone to eat lunch with and that every student feels like they're not alone and that they have a friend. So yeah, I think the best thing is to prevent bullying and to think about how we can do that in, in schools. And I know probably a lot of you are already working on that. Great, thank you. Um, so I think maybe we have one more um, and I'll do one that's kind of brief, Mary Beth, but this student is wondering in terms of applying the precedent established in Tinker, does that apply to all schools, private and public, or just public schools? It, the ruling applies to public schools only because the First Amendment says that Congress shall not limit the right to free speech, free press, free, um, freedom to assemble, etc. But the effect of the ruling has been also in independent schools and private schools because students want to have a voice. And why as administrators know that school is better when kids do have a voice and that that's part of education. In our case, it became very clear that students do have things to teach adults and teachers. And that's so true right now in these times when our society and our world is grappling with so many issues and we need the leadership of young people to help us find solutions. So that's part of the ruling as well. And it affects all students in all kinds of schools, but legally, public schools only. Great, that was a fantastic last question. I wish we had more time, but we're running out of time. So I will tell students if they wanna learn more about the case and teachers, um, that landmarkcases.org is a website that Street Law um, hosts in conjunction with the Supreme Court Historical Society. And we have a lot of readings and a lot of activities about um, Tinker v. Des Moines that you have to choose from if you want to find some more information there. Um, Tinker v. Des Moines is one of the cases on that site. And lastly, we want to thank all of you for attending today and all of the teachers for taking class time to do this. We know how valuable class time is, so we appreciate those of you who joined us live and those of you who might be um, watching this recorded. And if you are watching this recorded and you'd like to reach out to Mary Beth, um, I know we've been talking about sharing um, her email in the chat, but I will read it out for you. It is tinkertour. Um, written out, T-I-N-K-E-R-T-O-U-R dot at uh, Gmail. And um, we also definitely want to thank our hosts today, the Eighth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Missouri, and the Judicial Learning Center in St. Louis for making this all possible. And of course, we want to thank Mary Beth Tinker for taking time out to talk to us and share her really remarkable story about how a 13-year-old had such an important um, impact on the history of the United States and student speech. So uh, thank you all for being here today and thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, Kathy, and thanks to all the teachers, students, and everyone who attended. Bye, everyone, take care.